Browns from Ovesco, which is the Lewis Energy Company, uh, Fabrice Levesque from Southern Solar, and Andy Tugby from Southern Renewables. And uh, really, I think the opportunity for uh, this session is for anyone here who's uh, got any particular questions around uh, what they've seen today uh, to sort of ask those and to hopefully uh, have the result for you to help if you're thinking about doing something more in your property or work, uh, to actually to move that forward. You know, we obviously had a great opportunity to see the different technologies <coughs> in the hall, and you've heard a lot of, of useful information from uh, speakers here in the early sessions. Um, the suggestion here would be was that we might sort of initially take any technical questions. So, for example, if you've got a house with a uh, you know, west-facing roof or whatever. Is it worth doing something, and if so, what that might be? Uh, and then perhaps then leading on to some more general questions after that. Does that sound like a reasonable way to do it? I mean, unless anyone else has any kind of particularly burning uh, points, or uh, 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 but before we get into that, it'd probably be worthwhile giving each uh, person a chance to have a brief, uh, sort of a few minutes to talk about what your companies or organisations do and what you particularly feel you've got to offer uh, to the people in the first row. Okay. Do you want to start, Andy? Yeah, um, okay, so my name's Andy Tugby, I run a company called Southern Renewables. <coughs> We've been running as a, uh, as a renewable energy installer for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I ran a, a, a renewable energy consultancy based in London for about 10 years. So uh, we've got quite a strong background in renewables generally and a good understanding of how all the different renewable resources fit together. Um, I live in the village, I live in Priory Road, which is one of the things that I've, I think I could offer the Forest Road, but I like the fact that I'm here. Um, we uh, it predominantly install photovoltaics because that's where the market is, but we also install wind turbines and solar water. Uh, we, do, um, we, uh, we are involved in renewables, although the demand hasn't been there of, of late, but I imagine it will broaden from this point of view. So um, that's about it. Okay, thank you, Andy. Fabrice? Uh, my name's Fabrice, I'm from Southern Solar. Uh, we're, uh, again, an urban installation company. We do solar PV and solar thermal. Uh, the company's based in Lewis, so that's where our office is. And we've been trading for 10 years. So it started out with uh, RMD Howard Johns, who you might have heard of. Um, 10 years ago, man in the van doing solar thermal, which is mainly the hot water panels. And since then, the company's grown and grown. So the, uh, it's based in Lewis. Um, we have a Sussex office, which is where I'm from, and so we also have now offices around the south, so Bristol, Oxford, London. So the company has 10 years of experience in all types of solar, and we've weathered various subsidy comings and goings as well. So the company's quite used to the general atmosphere that surrounds kind of these subsidies. And yes, lots of installation experience, so thousands of customers. We work right from the small domestic up to the large-scale commercial and we have all our own in-house teams. So the company's got a good ethos. It's founded on the principles of trying to actually develop a good company that works in solar. And uh, yes, hoping to carry on. Obviously, you've heard about the feed and tariff um, changes, so just been digesting that this week. Um, but we've weathered previous storms, so it should be absolutely, absolutely fine. Great. Okay, thank you for bringing <coughs> Nick. Hello, I'm Nick Rouse. I'm the director of Avesco, which is a not-for-profit company in Lewis. Uh, we have, uh, of recent years, been uh, running the renewable grants from Lewis District Council, so have commissioned and supervised uh, a couple of dozen or more uh, photovoltaic systems. We've also recently installed our own uh, public uh, funded system, a uh, £300,000 <coughs> system on Harvey's brewery roof uh, uh, that is funded by subscriptions from 1000 to uh, 250 to £10,000 from local people now up and running. Okay. <coughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so yes, really the, the floor is over to, to uh, you. Uh, if uh, any of you have got any specific sort of technical uh, questions around uh, the renewables options that might be available, I've got one that maybe set the ball rolling. Um, I've got a, a fairly small 
photovoltaic installation, which has been a little bit disappointing in its performance because I live basically in woodland, so the exposure to the sun is not brilliant. So I'm wondering what the most logical next step is, whether I go for a bit of solar thermal or I go for some kind of ground source or air source heat pump. The house is modern and well insulated, so my heat requirement isn't that big. I also have the guilty sin of having an arga as well, which would uh, be nice to be able to have that kind of heat but without the gas being used. So maybe, Andy, you have a yeah. thought on a dilemma like that. Yeah, I'm just adjusting what you just said. So is it a gas or oil? It's a gas saga, yeah. Gas saga. Okay, I'd certainly investigate solar hot water. I think as, as perhaps the next step. Is that less sensitive to the amount of sun than uh, it's PV? Less, yeah, it's, it's less sensitive to shade than, yeah, is, okay. than is, uh, the photovoltaic, so it would be yeah. more tolerant of, of where you are. Uh, in terms of delivering hot water, obviously, without actually seeing the site, it's difficult to see how shade you are. Um, but if your PV system is not performing the way it's predicted because it's been shaded, then I imagine it's a reasonable amount of, sh of, of shade that, you, yeah, yeah. that, you, that you're seeing. Um, in terms of your heating, heat is a. It'd be, it, I, I'd be tempted to, um, if I were to, to, to hang on for a, for a little while and see what the renewable heat incentive says about which technologies it's favoured, because I don't know, I don't know if you, bring, I don't know, if you know more detail about the, the renewable heat incentive. Um, I know what it was originally under the Labour's yeah, suggestion, well, I mean, yeah, but what it will yeah, come the, the minister, That's the question, what, what, what yeah. is it likely Sorry. to be? I don't know what it was, but so it's worth just clarifying for the audit. Okay, so, so the renewable heating says, I, I assume everyone here is familiar with what the feed-in tariff scheme is and how that works in that the, there is a, 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 a government subsidised, well, not government subsidised, there's, a, hot, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a mechanism for uh, paying you for all the electrical energy that you generate uh, from renewable sources. The renewable heat incentive is uh, a similar type of scheme but for renewable heat that you produce. So if you've got uh, solar hot water, for instance, uh, or a, a wood pellet boiler, um, the, 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 if the heat is measured, then there's a, there's a mechanism for getting paid per unit for the heat that you, uh, that you generate. If you're a commercial customer, if, you, if you're a business and you've got a renewable heat source in your building uh, and that is metered, you then get paid, I think the rate at the moment is 7.9 pence per unit for every kilowatt hour of, energy, of heat energy that you produce. Uh, when that, that's the, the, the rate that, that you'll get as the renewable heat incentive as a domestic customer hasn't been released yet, so uh, I have no idea what the details are or what they're likely to be. And, um, does, this, does this just relate to new build or to no, existing? No, it, 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 it relates to new systems, but not to new build. There's also, if, if anyone's had a, <coughs> there was a ballot, again, I don't know if this still stands, but it was. <coughs> oh, sorry, it was the case that if the um, if your system, if you had a renewable energy heating system installed, uh, I think up to, was it a year ago, two years ago, yeah. a year ago? No, 2009. Yeah. 2009, yeah. anything installed yeah. since a, a, a cut-off point in 2009 will be eligible for the renewable heat incentive once it's in place. Mm. So I would, so, so, so with your, um, uh, with your place, I'd, I'd certainly hold on and see what the, the mechanism is uh, within that scheme and see if that covers your decision as to the best heating system to go for. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, let's see, has anyone else yeah. or, or can, add something to that? Can you not invest in an axe? James <laughs> 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 but it's, it's petrol power. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the, the point that uh, was brought up that solar, pan, uh, solar thermal is less sensitive, you have to realise that each of the cells in a photovoltaic panel is wired in series like lights in a Christmas tree. And not only that, but they generally wire several panels in series, so the same electrical current has to flow through all of them. So if you uh, shade just one of them, you're cutting the current through every cell in that panel. Whereas a, a solar thermal panel, it's just a percentage of the panel that's shaded that is, is not generating. Yeah. Okay. That was that was my question actually. Was you know because that was mentioned by Mark this morning. Uh, the, the problem with his roof uh, is there not a way around that? That if you have there a... is a technical way round um, for single panels. There are. You can either get panels that have each have their own little mini inverter, 
uh, so, uh, so that you're not shaded, one panel is shaded, you're not affecting other panels. And there's a slightly different way that adjusts the voltage and current in each panel in a string that does it. Um, they're not all that common, but they are obtainable. Can I just ask a question on that one? Uh, yeah. Um, I suppose more, more broadly speaking, you're absolutely right. If you've got um, a slightly shadier roof, the solar thermal panels are less susceptible to shade. So they are a better bet for a roof that does have a slight bit of shadow cast across it. Um, Nick's quite right. For the PD panels, you can get what are known as microinverters, which essentially each panel is isolated from the others, so you can handle shadow. Um, they're a bit more costly and slightly, uh, a slightly newer technology. So proceed with caution if you are sold with microinverters. Um, the U there is a UK company that produces them. There have been a few teething problems with that technology and a few uncertain things as to what you do when one of these bits goes wrong and it's on your roof. So obviously you need to put a scaffold to get to all 15 of them. <laughs> so ideally PV, avoid shade, is the simplest way to do it. Hot water, you can be a bit more, uh, take a bigger risk. Can I just ask a question on behalf of Tony? I mean, obviously you guys are expert. Is there any way in which Tony could actually improve the performance, apart from the investment in the axe? Very mind, you know, the, uh, it's got PV on the shade. Having, having not got microinverters, you can't easily read yeah, fit them. The, the other version, the National Semiconductors um, Solar Magic that allows them to go into strings is also a bit difficult to, to retrofit. You'd have to take each panel off yeah. and put it in behind there. Yeah, anything that does, either of the options that Nick mentioned, like you say, means taking all the panels off and changing everything and putting it away. Okay. If it's not, specific, yeah, if it's not specifically one tree that casts a particular shadow that you can't mm -hmm. get rid of, if it's literally the, the whole thing is shaded by the no. selective light. filling, yeah. so it's, it's outside my yeah. land, it's on the forest lands. So. I was going to say that's the thing, yeah. yeah. If, if over time, five years later, something, somebody, somebody's tree that's grows up, then. Yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. Part, really. yeah. 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 Do you feel there's a case there, Tony, of mis selling by some. <laughs> no, I, 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 was, I didn't ask enough questions, it was my fault, so completely. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Tony. Yeah, just going on that point, I'm being specific now. I was sold uh, on an American panel called Sunday, mm -hmm. um, which uh, advocates that it's better in, in uh, um, shady areas, and also with an inverter, and I can't think of his name, but as, as a specialist inverter, that, that actually it works better in a. Is that the case, or am I being sold apart? I think there, there isn't anything that works better in the shade. There are things that work better in the shade than other panels do. No, it doesn't. I, I'm not quite sure if you're communicating exactly what they've been said, but but if it, there are there are panels that are more shade tolerant, but well, it, my, it won't perform yeah. better in the shade. That, mm. My sight is my my sight uh, is around Russia getting put in yeah. is a is a mounted sight, uh, and it faces due south. But there are trees to the left and the right, which are, at certain times of the day will will actually cast a um, a bit of a um, a shadow on on some of the panels. Mm. And so when the guy came up and looked at it and he said, oh no, you need this uh, panel as opposed to what I was going to. And uh, I'm, always, I'm, I'm slightly nervous that I was being sold something that they were getting a better deal on. I like to smile. <laughs> and <laughs> or, 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 and uh, he used this excuse uh, as a means to, to, to change reality to this. The, there is a extent in which the people that sell these are trying to make a virtue out of a vice. Some solar panels saturate in full sunlight. Some of the thin film ones uh, actually um, stop, bend over, and are not so uh, efficient in bright sunlight. But conversely, you can say that they are therefore more efficient in low sunlight. <laughs> it's, it's hardly a virtue. <laughs> yeah, generally, generally the reason I smile is um, you're absolutely right. It's it, often they're sales tools. Essentially, um, yes, there are some panels that have a slightly different performance in low light level conditions. Mm. Um, it's marginal though, so it will make a bit of a difference. But it's not like there is there are two types of panel: one that will work fantastically in shade, and one that will, will do very little. Mm. All panels are made of the same materials, mm. will give or take slight tweaks, so they'll all behave pretty much in the same way. If someone says, "Okay, this is a specific inverter." that can do magic tricks, you need to ask them specifically what is the technical reason that this will be better in shade, for example, because often it's just literally 
we're talking percentage differences between how things are configured, mm -hmm. which doesn't make much of a difference to you as the person buying it and won't have much of a difference on the performance of your system. Yeah, there are some inverters uh, that don't drop off in efficiency quite so much at low rating. Most, most inverters are made to be at their most efficient at about sort of 85 to 90 percent of their full rating and drop off a bit at low levels. Some of the earlier ones uh, dropped off quite a bit, but these days most inverters are still well up in the 80s down to about 30% of their rated current. So there isn't that much to gain from, from them some are so a little tiny bit better. That's right. Yeah, no, I was going to say, Andy, do you want to add on that? Uh, no, no. And, uh, we'd like to just to pick up on Tony's point. Uh, explain what an inverter is to the uninitiated. Yeah. Panels produce DC, you want AC mains, an inverter converts whatever voltage the panels are to 240 volts AC to, to uh, drive your mains. And how um, close do you need the inverter to be matched to the number of panels you've got? Is there a kind of direct correlation? Or can you have an inverter that could take a, a range of the, the relationship between the type, the, 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 the performance and the number of panels to the inverter is absolutely critical and that's what, design, that's what a well designed system does mm. and it isn't, it isn't even necessarily possible to take uh, 4 kilowatts of one type of panel and 4 kilowatts of another type of panel and put the same inverter on it, it doesn't necessarily work that way, the, the voltage tolerances need to be right and the power tolerances and the current tolerances need to be right. And it can even affect, it even needs to be affected the way you actually wire the panels together mm. need to be appropriate for that particular inverter. Um, uh, and and it's, it may be possible to chop and change inverters and panels, but it would need to be designed on a, on a system by system basis. Finally tuned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It needs to be designed properly, otherwise yeah. it just won't work. And does the, do the micro inverters make it much more flexible, even you know, with the teething problems that you mentioned? Does that make it much easier to move things around and manipulate them, it if they're all independent? You, it gives you a bit more flexibility, I think it, a bit more modular in terms of, you know, you don't have one inverter which you don't specify or a number of panels. Um, it does give you a bit more flexibility, but it's the, still, still the same principle, so you can mm. add a different type of panel um, with, using the same micro inverter. Mm -hmm. So each, pretty much, yeah, the message is pretty much each system is pretty bespoke. It's built to its own tolerances, so once it's up, and it's not a case that I can add an extra 10 panels and it just needs to make a small tweak. In the early days, about sort of six or seven years ago, it was frequently specified that the inverter was actually slightly below rating on the basis that you would only lose a little bit because they're very rarely flat out, only when the sun is straight up. And you spend a lot of time when the power is only a fraction of it, so if you had a, an inverter that was slightly better at the lower ends, uh, you could actually get more energy by having taking your inverter at rated slightly less than the panels. These days, the inverters tend to be fairly flat in their um, performance all the way through. One of the things you can do with the micro inverters, if you happen to have a roof, a funny roof where the panels are at different angles. Um, you can string them up with micro-inverters and, and not lose what you would if you tried to string two sets of panels at slightly different angles. Okay. With regards to the question on the inverters, mm -hmm. um, what actually is the difference between, I understand it's better to have the inverter closer to the solar panels as possible, so that either could be in the loft or in the garage, which most people have. Not much current lost either way. The uh, the voltage on the panels these days is about roughly equal to the mains voltage. In, in the early days they used to be lower, but the, the voltage is up in three, four, sometimes a bit more volts. So you've got the same voltage and the same current, so in the same uh, diameter wire between the panels and the inverter and the inverter and the, um, your switchboard uh, is roughly the same cable losses. Neither of them are very big. And what about the silver coated cables? I heard there's a silver coated cable that's more 
the efficient than the stones would have came? No, there's some, some of them are less liable to be eaten by rats and uh, less liable to be damaged. But uh, it's, it's, it's the amount of copper in the cable that tells you how much you're going to lose on the cable. Yeah. And the Picards, the uh, panels, I mean, they come from China, Australia, Austria, Wales, and Wales, whatever. Germany? Yeah. So America? That's a good question. Is there that much difference in them? As Fabian's already said, the, the Pretty much all the panels are made out of the same stuff. There are, there are, there are, there are lots of uh, manufacturing plants in the world that put panels together. There are only, I can't remember, uh, for, for a time, there were only seven places in the world that actually made the wafers, the actual silicon wafers themselves. And, and every panel that's made anywhere, the parts came from one of those places. I think there are more places now. But for a time, there were only a few places that the, that the actual components could come from. So, but, but it's all the same stuff. Yeah, 90% or more of the panels are silicon. Mm. There are a few funny materials, cadmium telluride and, and such like, coming around, which may be good, but they haven't had a long time in the market to prove it. Um, yeah, so if, you're look, if you're looking at solar panels, um, generally, because they're all pretty much the same thing, um, it's more look at the company that makes the, <coughs> the brand name of the panels. And you can look up, you know, is it an Austrian company, is it Australian, is it Chinese? And that's probably far more indicative of the type and quality of panel you're getting um, than whatever kind of technical bits. Because they tend to all kind of highlight, okay, we've got this, we've got that. But actually most panels all have the same characteristics. So really it's a case of the Chinese panels, um, they're tempting because they're a lot cheaper. Um, but then they're heavily subsidised by the Chinese government. Whereas, for example, some of the European manufacturers, there's an assembly plant in Wales, so it comes from slightly less further afield. Um, but you're quite right, Ellie. Although silicon is, is all produced pretty much in Europe, so it's much for much less, really. Although, although I, I, I did have a conversation with someone um, a few years ago from DTI that was explaining that, that um, made in England can be assembled in England. Mm. Uh, so that could be the final, the final screws left off. So they're shipped as one piece minus the screw, put together in, in Wrexham, and it becomes a main panel, so that's something else. The, most of the panels that do fail don't fail because of the silicon. Mm -hmm. Most of them fail because sealing around the edges or the connections lift and, and, and these things, which is where the assembly company <laughs> is fairly important. Right. There are there are there are manufacturers you can that you can see they, they they term it vertically integrated and what that tends to mean is that all the bits are made in the same place, mm. um, and that's usually quite a good sign that, that, that there's a quality control issue that, that's being looked at. If a company says that their manufacturing process is vertically integrated, that means they make the cells, they do the wiring, they put it together, they put it in the glass, they make the panel, they screw it together, they put it in a package and they send it out, all, the, all in the same building. So does that? that Give more direct accountability in terms of quality, which you. Uh, I'd say so. I mean, it allows it allows uh, it allows um, quality control throughout the process. Yes, you must think that a twenty-five year guarantee is only of any use if you think the company is going to be there in twenty-five <laughs> years. <laughs> so. Okay. What are the key differences between the types of panels? I've heard of mono, crystalline, and yes. probably amorphous. <laughs> Well, the mon monocrystalline are made out of a single cell, or well, a single cell, but each uh, wafer is a single silicon cell sliced into a really thin wafer, fit together and wired together, and a polycrystalline cell is made out of lots of little bits, all kind of sandwiched together. Right. Well, they're, they're grown together. If you grow a single crystal, all the atoms line up in an exact nice neat stack. Mm -hmm. and, a monocrystalline are grown in large uh, um, cylindrical um, columns that they pull out of the mount and do it. If you let the silicon uh, cool by itself without doing this careful pulling out the mount, you get some crystals going this way and some going that way and some going that way. And if you look on the front of them, you get this rather pretty pattern where, where there are slightly different colour, mm. blue or purple, and you can do them. And those are uh, polycrystalline. And because there are junctions between the uh, crystals, there are losses there. So the polycrystalline are generally slightly less efficient than monocrystalline. Uh, the 
they used to be a lot cheaper, but the difference between polycrystalline and monocrystalline has tended to drop. So uh, more and more the panels are uh, monocrystalline. There are amorphous ones round where they're not even in a crystal. Um, they are not very efficient and there are not a great number of them around. Mm. And they're more suited to large industrial scale things mm. where you can cover a huge area at a much lower cost and the efficiency doesn't matter because you've mm. just got a huge space to play with. It's not really yeah. something that's relevant to the domestic market at the moment. Mm. Um, on that, on that, just the point of efficiency, that's one of the things that people often get hung up with with solar panels. Efficiency generally is a measure of space efficiency, so it's how many watts you get per square meter. So, um, which only really affects you if you've got limited space. So if you've got limited space, you want a slightly more efficient panel so you can get more or, you can get more watts on the space that you've got. The efficiency of the panel is the efficiency of the conversion of, of sunlight into uh, electricity is pretty much the same. Yes, for you, almost all pounds. You want to consider the pounds per kilowatt, yeah. how much it costs per kilowatt, mm. um, yeah. rather than the absolute efficiency. Unless, as you, as it says, uh, your your roof space is particularly limited, and you're trying to ram as many watts as you can on a mm. very limited space. So, I mean, it uh, sort of sounds what we've heard so far. I mean, I mean my take mm. is that it sounds like the technology itself is all pretty much. On a par, you've got to have a bespoke system that's appropriate. Uh, but ultimately, is your suggestion there that it's really about the, the cost? The cost uh, and, and, uh, and a reliable um, supplier, mm -hmm. a reliable yeah. installer, and a reliable manufacturer of the panels. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there is a bit, there is a, there is an of build quality in yeah. panels that, yeah. is, that is different. You get you a different feel to it. German panel or a Japanese panel, then you'll get to a Chinese panel. It's still every bit is likely to last 25 years and to and to perform to its to its uh, its predicted performance. But you just kind of get a sense of a great sense of comfort if you like with something that feels a bit better. It's a bit like getting in a, an Audi and shutting the door, or getting in a Fiat Punto and shutting the door. It feels different. Can you just comment briefly? Sorry, is it a question? No, we can carry. It's a different question for the panel. Yeah. Um, can you just comment briefly on planning issues, whether it's to do with installing on roof or on the ground? Yeah. Well, planning wise, um, if it's on the ground, you will need um, planning permission. Um, within a small, there is a certain size you can be a minimum size you can have. Um, but that's pretty tiny, so most people, unless you're having a very small ground mounted installation, you'll need planning permission. Mm -hmm. um, if it's on a roof, a lot of your house, within certain parameters, um, not too high above the roof, not above the road line, you've got uh, planning permission. So just like satellite dishes, that kind of thing, you're fine. And um, that applies to conservation areas as well, so no need to go to the planners for that. Anything above that, so Article 4, A and B listed, um, then. Yeah, Area of outstanding natural beauty, anything like that, you will parks. need to national park. You will need to make a planning application. Um, if well, the that's not, that's interestingly enough, though, that's not what our district council have told us. Really, in the national park. It does depend. On, they said you don't need. To. Mm. Yeah, as long as you you know don't go like you say above the ridge line and mm. things like that. They might have a specific policy that takes an exception to the general approach. That would mean yeah. that's yeah, people like yeah. In AOMBs, anywhere where there is generally planning, planning is a bit more tightly regulated. People like to check, mm. uh, but all planning officers are quite um, relaxed about solar panels, especially if you're putting them at the back of your house. Mm. If they're not highly visible, then they're very likely to rule. So once you've checked, they'll just say, go ahead and do it. But because well, you know what planners are like, get it in writing. To check. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> get the name of the person, get it in writing. Yeah. Be safe. I think the rules on standalone ones in the garden are nine square metres and not more than three metres in any direction. This is a relatively small mm. array. Mm. However, it, you have got um, planning uh, consent on any outhouses. You can put them on the garage, on the potting shed, as long as it's <laughs> within the curtilage of your house and the panels are connected to the house power supply, uh, then you have uh, Mm. Permission without, uh, yeah. Right. 
I mean, so for us, we installed PV panels, and we were just suggested that we write to the planners, just notify them, make them aware, so there weren't any issues, and, yeah. and that that worked effectively for us. Uh, Going back to the uh, the discussion that we had this morning about the the, the feed-in tariffs, um, but so ignoring the the debate and so on, we're now the 13th of December and so on. That's all changed. You know, how how does that really you know, how does it look really from, you know, without, without getting into the, you know, the politics and the, and the details, you know, how, do, how does it really look? Would it be okay actually if we just part one, Mike, because hmm? we were going to do with the technical ones. I just yep. wanted to ask the question, unless there are any other technical questions from the floor. I mean, are there any maintenance issues associated with the panels on a sort of, yeah, for a 25 year life? Um, there are no moving parts on the panels themselves. You want to keep them free of bird dropping as much as possible. But, uh, <coughs> the main issues, make sure that they're relatively, uh, relatively clean is the main issue with the panels, if you can get to them. Uh, if anyone has installed your panels, they should, well, they should, be, but they may well offer you a maintenance agreement. I look into what that actually includes. Um, we have a maintenance agreement that we offer, and for that, we'll uh, come out and we'll clean your panels, we'll uh, check the inverter over, make sure it's doing what it should be doing. <coughs> And if we've installed a monitoring system on your si on your system, we'll, we'll uh, take a regular look at the outputs. <coughs> Sorry, oh, I've been talking a lot today. My voice is going um, <coughs> If we've installed a monitoring system on your on your um, on your system, and we've got a maintenance contract with you, then we'll look at the outputs from your system on a, a, a weekly basis, so that we can see whether the outputs are, are looking as they as they ought to be. Um, in terms of the actual maintenance, the, 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 the parts of a PV system are pretty much maintenance free. You, there's no real need for you to take out a maintenance contract with, with any, I, I don't know if you do that in terms of providers. Not for domestic yeah. uh, installations, no. But commercial scale where if you've got hundreds of panels, yeah, it might make sense to have someone to go over once a year, we do. Uh, but you're, you're quite right. Um, our advice is um, they're very low maintenance. So obviously make sure there's nothing on the panels and there's no damage to them visually, um, but just by keeping an eye on your inverter, you'll be able to check it's still working fine. And there are no very few moving parts, if any, so wear and tear is um, very little. Um, the one thing most people should be aware of, and you probably are, is that the inverter in the lifespan of your panels will probably need to be replaced because they have a finite um, lifespan. So that's the one thing that once it goes, it goes. <coughs> so again, roughly how many years? We say 10 years, the manufacturers say they build them to last 20, so 10 to 15 is a good conservative sort of bet really. You can get extended warranties, but I think your experience is probably the same, imagine steer clear because it feels like a bit of a con really. And but inverters, you can't really, once they go, I'm sure it will explain yeah. why, they, they go, so you can't really maintain them, it's literally, it works fine and then it will just go. So where do you go if you have a system and the inverter fails? The first step should be with your installer. Yeah. Um, and if the installer is still around, <laughs> around, if the installer is not around, then it goes to the manufacturer. And with regards to monitoring of these units, what's one of the key type of monitors it, you know would judge its sort of productivity, etc. <coughs> it tends to be related to the inverter because that's um, an easy place to to monitor. So if you're choosing an inverter, all manufacturers offer a monitoring device. Yeah. So they each have got their own little box. Yeah. It's usually sort of partly a toy. It does have the useful, usual, usually the useful thing that you can download the information to a PC. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a useful kind of log of what your system produced, mm -hmm. go for one that you can actually download the information from. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it would literally be a case, say you wanted to compare today's mm -hmm. figures with 10 years ago, you'd mm -hmm. have to sort of go back through your log. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always to do with the inverter, really. So it should be something that anybody offers as standard, really. There are also third-party um, monitoring systems that are available to, that will that will take the data from the from the inverter and put it onto a web uh, a web portal if you'd like to like Mark, Mark dazzled us with his graphs this morning. <laughs> <laughs> my my system went in seven years ago when when these. Uh, Fancy readouts were not common, and I have a little transmitter that transmits to my bedroom, and I like it down every. Day. <laughs> 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 you, you wouldn't do it these days. Though, yeah. in, in fact, in connection with that, we, I did have a conversation with Mark, uh, uh, who did present his uh, spreadsheet and outputs, and we were suggesting that within Forest Road, it might be useful if we were kind of pooling our 
uh, experience with, for those people who've got panels, mm -hmm. and just to start creating like a sort of say knowledge base where we say a panel that's in shade, <laughs> say uh, this you know this type, this is the kind of performance that we're seeing. Panel that's open, south facing, etc. This is the kind of performance and actually start say uh, sharing that information to help people get a feel for what kind of performance they might. <coughs> Might actually expect. So that's uh, great. Someone wants to, to, to can collect that, to put it on the website. There. Yeah. yeah. There, are one, there are a couple of online programs if you want to predict what your um, output would be. One is by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in America. If you look up NERL, they have a, a system. And there is a thing called PVGIS, uh, uh, which is a European. Uh, thing and you put in uh, your latitude and longitude or a local thing, what angle it is facing and how far up and, um, and the panel size and that will give you, it won't tell you about shading, you need a rather, there are, there are sophisticated programs um, that will do it, PV SIST, but it costs several hundred pounds to do uh, and only uh, relatively well off installers have it worked very well I can, I, I can uh, <laughs> tell you but it is not a, a thing for the amateur but those two ones I've told you will give you a pretty good estimate of what you are people worry about whether they're uh, a few degrees off due south and they're not tilted up at quite the right angle. Mm -hmm. It's not much of an effect if you put the figures in the, the program there it will tell you fairly accurately what <coughs> a unshadows system would get. The, um, the, when, when your, uh, there's a, bit, a fairly key piece of information, when your system is, is commissioned um, the, the installer should give you a, a handover of some sort of paperwork and somewhere on that should be a prediction of the amount of energy that your system should produce in a year. That that's kind of, it has to be on that piece of information. And the thing that you want to do is at the end of the first year, have a look and see how the number on your meter compares to that number there. Um, it should be, it should be fair bit better. Yes. The standard assessment procedure is fairly pessimistic for around here. We are a particularly sunny bit. Yeah. If you use... Uh, PVGIS, it uses a much better database for the sunlight hours and the uh, shadowing and such, uh, cloud cover around here. But it, you should definitely make the, around here, the standard assessment procedure is, is a fairly pessimistic uh, estimate of what you should get here. I certainly confirmed that from our experience that we're producing more than what was predicted by our installer. Mm. Anything to add to that? Yeah, that's often something that crops up. Is, yeah, as you said, we're all obliged to use this um, UK average um, when providing quotes to ensure sort of fairness. So when you get a quote from the store, it should say, um, here is what you'll produce. Um, everyone knows that, yes, we're in the south, so we actually produce more. Um, it's fairly easy. You can use PVGIS. We have a slightly cheaper version of PVSYST for domestic installations as well. So there is software out there which can give you a better educated guess as to what you'll produce given local conditions. So if an installer says, okay, here's your prediction, it's going to be plus 20% because the way risk factors, you can ask them for actual an actual piece of information, an actual printout of something, rather than just a sort of, a, okay, it's going to produce a bit more the information is out there, because that is often a evidence sticking point. And that is the payback actually dictated by what's, what you generate rather than what's on the certificate? So what's on the certificate? What does that count for in terms of just that, that's just, that's just a useful number to look at in terms of making sure that you that, that your performance is. Yeah, yes, no, I understand that. But in is terms that of registering, is that not then accumulated? Is that not accumulated into the final number that I charge mm -hmm. Andrew Coyes to say you've got X amount of megawatt capacity that's installed? Is that not based on these? No, no, the 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 the, 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 the um, the number that we're talking about is the generated energy, the energy generated by the by the system, not yeah. the installed capacity. Oh, okay. The installed capacity is set by the number of the number of panels you've got on the roof, and that's the number that Charles is talking about. The installed capacity of so many kilowatts, as opposed to kilowatt hours. We're talking about. Right. Okay. Any other questions? I'm aware we've talked about yours, Mike. Just so I can. 
Uh, yes, well, you, you, heard, you heard from Mike earlier about the, uh, the impact of the uh, cuts in the feeding tariff. And uh, what's, what's the panel's feeling about the actual impact of that on potential installers uh, and the market? I mean, obviously, you guys are in the business of still selling uh, uh, panels. And, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's. <coughs> The two things really, obviously there's a cut, which means that people are looking at installing solar panels from last week, they were expecting a certain amount, and this week it will be half that. So obviously that's quite a big drop. And it's the other second part is it's been sprung on us um, in five weeks' time. So, I mean, probably the same for you guys, but for us, you know, we were fully booked for six months. Large commercial projects take a long time to work up all sorts of uh, applications you need to make. Um, so yeah, a bit of a body blow to the industry in terms of how do you plan and run a business when you order kit several months in advance and then you get given five weeks to actually finish all your work. Um, but that said, the cut had to come and to be honest, it's good in the way because it will mean that only the best installations go ahead. You have to make sure your roof is unshaded, is south facing. Um, with the artificially high feeding tank that we had before, um, as you saw, lots of companies sprung up, and you didn't really have to pay much attention to what you're doing. You just put panels anywhere. Given you're paid so much, you didn't really have to worry too much about the details. So it's going to make us more efficient, but it's also not a great way to encourage an industry to grow or to give consumers much confidence. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Um, it still works very well, and thanks to the drop in panel prices, I think systems will still pay for themselves in roughly sort of 10 or 11 years, which is what the scheme kind of aims for. Hopefully, will entice a few of them to go ahead and actually put it thousand degrees. Right. Um, well, my, my, our feeling is that it, 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 very, very similar to what Fabian said is that the, the well-run businesses will will weather the storm well because uh, because the, there's because there are good processes in place because they're good people because they build their, their we build we certainly we build our customer base on relationships rather than on quick sell so so that's uh, and that sort of thing will will, will kind of weather us through but and i think um as, as i said before the 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 actual rate yeah it's been cut in half but the the actual resultant rate of 21p is actually still good enough to make it a viable prospect with uh, with um panel prices and, and kit prices having come down as much as they have i mean it's not an amazing deal like it is at the moment um, but it's still good business, and uh, there'll be there will undoubtedly be a, a completely flat period between the end of, between the 12th of December and the New Year, when I can't imagine anyone installing anything you know, in, the, in the industry. But I think once the once the sort of headiness of Christmas is over and people start to think about what what to do going forwards, and they look again at this at this feeding tariff rate without comparing it to 43p, because I think that's the key. If you look at it on its own. It's all right. If you look at it and go, yeah, it's not as good as it was, yeah. then you'll always be disappointed. Yeah. But if you look at it as, if, if we'd never had 43p and people were looking at the feeding tariff now, we'd be saying, actually, that's not bad. You know, it's not bad. It, it, it's, when it's being able to get out of this mindset of comparing it to what, what we've had. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And once you can get people away from that, I think the business, the market will pick up again and the good companies will float to the top, as they always do, and, and the industry will, will prosper again. The German, the German uh, uh, industry has survived, uh, I think, four cuts in the feed-in tariff now. Each, each case, there, there was a rush before and a slight dearth afterwards, but in each case it has picked up. And their, their rates are not that much different. The newest cut takes it down to €23 Euro cents, uh, a kilowatt hour. It's didn't, not that much different. Didn't Spain do it retroactively? Mm. Spain, yeah. Are the, yeah, Spain are the only country in Europe who've actually gone back and changed tariffs to people already installed. Because what all this does as well is it creates doubt in people's minds that, okay, there, there's talk of tariff changes. Once you've got your system, you don't want to find out in five years that the government are cutting you in half as well. Mm -hmm. Not you literally, obviously, but your tariff. Um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, Spain are the one country in Europe that have actually gone back and adjusted people's tariffs. So that's, that's another disadvantage of what's going on, is the fact that they, they keep doing things slightly knee-jerk and rapidly creates doubt in people's minds that, well, okay, if they're willing to do this, maybe they'll be willing to do what the Spanish did, which was to cut retro retrospectively. All of that but, said. Okay. But, the, but the other thing is you make an assumption of what the future electricity prices will be. Mm -hmm. uh, now, 
the chart that we had earlier, you know, I mean, we all know the prices have gone up 40%, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So if those prices continue to increase at that rate, then actually the payback time becomes not 11 years, but 10 years, 9 years, and so on. Exactly. Because the external prices are, are the, rising. The thing, the thing that's happened with the, with the feeder tariff being cut is that the electricity price becomes much more of a factor in the calculation. Mm, yes. Because if, you, if the average uh, electricity cost is 12 per unit at the moment, let's say, and you're getting 43p unit, that's quite a big difference. But if you're talking 21p, and 17p in yep. a couple of years' time, then that's yep. you know the, the actual feeding tariff rate is not as much of a factor as the electricity saving. So I think that, that in terms of how customers look at their uh, how how customers look at new installations with the new feeding tariff rate it needs to be much more biased around getting systems designed appropriate to the size of the property. It seems from what um, Suzanne was saying that there's a sort of lifestyle changes as well. That if it's a sunny day, rush out and do your, uh, yeah. you know, use the electricity while it's coming in. Sure. Just wanted to sort of pick up on the comment there about the sort of potential change in shape of the, uh, the market or the suppliers. I mean, I think at the moment we see there's two kind of models that are being offered. One is the supplier who wants to come and install your, uh, install the panel, take the fit, and let you get the uh, free time. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, take the fit and give you the free electricity. Yeah. The other one is the one that you basically pay for, and then take. But do you think that we're going to see a falling away of those? I think there's the four ones. What's the one that's basically mm -hmm. giving free installation? I think we'll see the that. Yeah. It looks like yeah. It looks like the, they've changed the tariffs of the rental roof. Um, far more drastically. Mm -hmm. Effectively, the more installations you own, the lower your tariff is. So if you own thousands of roofs, then you'll get less and less and less. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me, clearly, it's been designed to kill them off. Mm -hmm. um, some of the larger installer companies have said they'll stop doing rent-a-roof. The few large companies that are specifically rent-a-roof have said, we're going to carry on. Um, but yeah, I don't quite meet just person. I don't quite know how they'll make the business as well, because yeah. the tariffs are being slashed. Yeah. It will also affect schemes like us that would put the roof on harvest the we we're offering a four percent return on investment to the local investors uh, we wouldn't be able to do that um, in a future scheme whether we can still attract investors if we can only offer two or one and a half percent interest um, i don't know but certainly we can't do it <coughs> Still better than putting it in the bank at the moment. Right? Yes, uh, in, indeed it is. Can we persuade the, the punters? That's <laughs> true, is it? It's, it's, it's the question. Uh, we, we got uh, investors fairly quickly for the scheme on Harvest Roof. It surprised me that we, we got them all. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think it would be a harder job What's next the time. Size of that scheme? The lady yeah. over there asked right? the question. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> This morning, Charles Hendry said that he knows that the cost of prices of installations has come down by 30%, and even up to 70 Is that true? No, I don't think so. No. The panels themselves have dropped far more than the cost of the system. There has been a, a mighty drop in the cost of the panels, yeah. uh, but the inverters have not dropped so much. The... Uh, bars for putting it on, the cables, the labour, the cost of putting a scaffolding up have all more or less stayed the same. So the cost of a system has not dropped nearly that much. 30% is, is probably a reasonable price, whereas the price of the panels has come down like 70% in two years. Oh, that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. You, you agree with that? And just really picking up on the other question around uh, electricity usage. Uh, again, I've got some panels on my roof. Um, I used to work from home, but don't now. Uh, I do do the practices of trying to you know, wait to put the dishwasher on and the washing machine on during the day to try and maximise. Uh, just wondering what, sort of on, on average, whether you guys have got a feeling for what you really believe is a realistic saving to project for a household. Uh, you know, on, a kind of, on that sort of uh, basis on electricity use? I'd say proceed with caution. Really. Percentage, yeah. Percentage um, say. Generally, I think the rule of thumb is assume you can use half. Um, that's very basic. You know, for people comparing installations, 
between companies. Um, when it comes down to specifics, you really have to be at home during the day um, to turn on your appliances to make the most of your electricity. If you work nine to five, the house is empty, um, and you've got no way of turning your appliances on. So you could if you put timers in. If you're not there in the day, your solar system will generate most of its energy when you're out. So you'll use, actually use very little of what you produce in the house. So certainly you have to, that's basically it really. If you can be there in the day to use it, then yes. You, with a bit of careful use, you can use a lot. If you're not there, then it can be much less. This is very much a, a, a concern with the free panel system, where, where you get the electricity, but you only get the electricity you use at the instant it's generated. If, if you've got a nine to five job, and you're only there in the evening and nothing's being used in the day, then the vast bulk of your electricity will just flow out into the grid and not benefit you. When you come home, if it's getting dark and the sun's going down, mm. you'll, you turn on everything and you'll be buying the electricity at the full price. But didn't there yeah. used to be something for storing the electricity at one time? There is no reasonably economic way of storing electricity. Mm. It will double the price of your system at least. If you're on a croft up the top of a Scottish hill and there is no electricity, you've got no other choice. You will have expensive electricity, but that's the only way of doing it. Uh, but if you have mains connection, it is very unlikely that the economics would be in your favour. The cost of the batteries will be two or three times the, the cost of the system uh, and would fill your garage up. Yeah, so really there is, uh, all right, saying then, you say that the fit benefit is falling uh, and it's supposed to be offset in a way by the rising electricity price, but the only way you're going to get that that benefit that offsets that mm. is by actually making yes, sure that you actually use, use it and yeah. that you're at home during the day or able to go on time switches or whatever. So mm. I think you know, we need to be aware that that is an important variable in uh, getting the benefit going forward. I've, I've got the advantage of, of working from home, so I, I can do all this, you know, run the appliances in the daytime. My roof is southwest northeast, so I, and and is not overlooked. It's on a hill, so I'm not in any shade. But it's tiny. Uh, I live in a two up two down terraced house. It's wondering why, and that southwestern side has a VLS window in it. So there isn't really very much um, space. Is it, is it worth, can I, do I have enough space to be worth trying? Yes, you, it depends on the actual area. If you buy the most efficient panels around, say, the Sanyo ones or the Sun Power ones, you can get 250 watts in a panel about this big. So four of them give you a kilowatt. Even the kilowatt system is quite a useful size, will give you a certain amount of energy. And if you can get more than, more than that, there, then you're definitely in positive territory. Yeah. If, you can get, if you can get six panels in, any way you like, doesn't matter which way around you, can put them at angles, you can, you know, in any way that they fit in. Yeah. Any, any panels you put on will generate electricity. If you, even if you only put two panels on it, it will generate electricity which, from which you will receive some benefit and which will collect electricity that you use. The, the, the economies of scale, I mean, the more panels you, you put up, the cheaper it becomes because there are certain fixed costs like scaffolding and labour and things. It takes, it, takes just as, you know, it takes almost as long to put two, about two panels up as it does to put ten panels up. Um, uh, and so it, there are some things that you will have to pay for which would be the same cost as if we had 10 panels, but everything you put on generates you some electricity and generates you some money. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Barry. Just, I think you mentioned that the, in Germany, was it, the feed and tariffs have been cut four times? Four times that I, I believe. I, I missed this morning, so forgive me if I'm being yeah. ignorant here, but is, is feed and tariff cut always related to growth in the industry? Uh, in the German case, the, the rate has been almost constantly going up slightly, but it's it's sawtooth because it, there's this rush before each cut and a drop afterwards. But uh, year on year, the Germans have been putting more each year in, and it's an enormous amount. I think it's eight eight thousand megawatts worth of last what year. What percentage is it of the 
production. Of the world's production? No, German production. Oh, oh, the percentage oh, is solar. Oh, solar. Well, their electricity production is... Oh. You say the percentage of their electricity production comes from solar PV, is that? Is that what you're asking? What percentage of the German electricity production is created by solar energy? Oh, it's still down in single figures of percentage. Uh, it's, it's higher than the tiny amount that we've got here, but it is, it's... it's uh, yeah, you hear various kind of figures. I mean, three, the, the equivalent of three nuclear power stations is what they actually have installed, I think, roughly. So that's pretty pretty big. Um, I think, is it March? Yeah. Oh, four, no, sorry, yes. Eight, yeah, in, in terms of... Because the power stations are continuous in, in yeah. actual yeah. Yeah. Rate, yeah. rate of use, it's a lot higher, but so, yes, yeah. yes, you're yeah. probably about right. Yes. Uh, um, and I think in spring of this year, first time estimate, um, on one afternoon, more than half their electricity demand was met by PV for the first time. So they do have a lot. Um, but the thing with solar is, it has to be complemented with other things as well, because obviously in, in summer, in the daytime, the grid will be a water <coughs> of electricity because all the PV generators are making electricity. In winter, they'll produce much less. So although there's 8 gigawatts, um, it's not the equivalent of 8 gigawatts of nuclear, because that's constant power. Mm -hmm. right. On the, on the feeding tax, you're saying, is it related to um, growth in the industry? Mm. Um, in theory, it's not supposed to be. Um, in theory, it's the, the tariff is set at the return that is a, attractive to investors or like, householders to actually install systems, because it's a subsidy to kind of encourage them to do it. So the way they set the tariffs is looking at, you know, okay, how long does it take for a system to pay for itself? Um, and then the other thing that's happened here is it's more to do with politics and budgets um, how much they really want to subsidise green energy and that's why they've had to cut it because they decided to set quite a small budget demand um, far outpaced that budget so they've had to cut it down to a level that they think will make the budget last rather than what's really actually applicable on the ground to. So if, if we saw a massive increase in solar installations in the UK you don't think that would necessarily bring down the feeding tariff? I mean, that's the point that, that Charles Henry was saying. Is that I wasn't here, so... Yeah, yeah, he was saying that, that, that uh, there's been three times the predicted installation okay. right. uh, that's occurred, and so it's almost, well, his argument was that therefore it's used up the fund a lot more quickly than they were expecting. Uh, we're almost out of time here. I think we've had a very useful uh, uh, panel session. Just just one final question, really. You've been very helpful, I think, with regard to some uh, technical things. and. Uh, if you're saying now the market, this rental roof uh, model is likely to fall out uh, of the picture, how, how would someone uh, differentiate between the sort of reputable suppliers that are left in the marketplace uh, to help them you know, to decide on who to go with? Uh, is it just a cost consideration? I think there's mention of quality. So can I just invite you just to make sort of a final <laughs> pitch? <laughs> 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 and I'll just step out. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things that uh, I, I, I don't really want to um, get too deep into this, if I'm honest, but one of the things that I think is uh, is, is really important is the, is the sort of continu continuity of people within who you deal with. You know, if you get someone that comes to your house to sell you a system that you know you're never going to see again, they're going to pass you on to someone else, pass on to someone else, that's to be avoided at all costs, in, 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 in my experience. What we as a company, this is, I mean, I think this is the one, it's not a differentiating factor at all, but it's one thing that we really believe in is that the person that comes to your house to, to look at you, to talk to you about whether your system is right for you will be the person that deals with your quote, will be your first point of contact until the, the job's actually installed and when it's being installed they'll be available for you to talk to if you need to and then they'll come and they'll see you at the end and they'll, uh, the, when the job's finished they'll hand over the, the documentation so that that's your continuity of, of who you're dealing with so that you know you're dealing with the whole picture. Yeah, we install, like Southern Solar, we install ourselves, we don't use outside companies to do the installation. Um, so we totally, 100% believe in everything in the process that we do. We believe in our customer service and our workmanship and our guarantees that, 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 that come with the system because we do it all ourselves. And I think there's, there's, no, uh, there's no, you can't replace that. You know, and if, and the other thing as well, which is, which is a point to that, obviously, obviously the installer needs to have all the relevant qualifications and, uh, and, and accreditations. 
But one thing to be aware of is that the um, at the moment the, the, the installer needs to be MCS accredited in order for you to get the feeder tariff. And in order to be MCS accredited, you need to be associated with a re, with a, an assurance scheme called the REAL R E A L assurance scheme. Now that that covers the MCS installer. It doesn't necessarily cover the salesman, the sales people that, that if it's if it's a sales company that are just coming to sell you something which they're then going to pass on to an MCS installer, they don't have to be covered by the same assurances, which means they can hard sell you if they want to. Now, it is the, it, uh, it, it's the, it's, sorry, I don't want to make too long. Is that right? Thank yeah. you. Uh, but Rick, yeah, but the basic point is, yeah, as Andy's saying, and check for MCS. Everybody has MCS, it's not hard to get. Um, RAL is really good because, as he says, it's a code of conduct. So essentially, um, certain rules that we're not allowed to break. Um, because there has been a lot of mis-selling kind of cowboy practices and you know, sign now. Um, so just, you don't have to go for the hard sell, really. There are lots of companies that we all do a reputable job. Unfortunately, there are some people who feel the need to kind of try and get a check there and there. So if anybody's doing that, there is absolutely no need to deploy that kind of a tactic. We, our businesses run fine. We just give information. We don't force people to buy anything. So if it's a hard sell, avoid it at all costs. And yeah, make sure that they have their own teams of people so you have continuity start to finish really and just ask for you know, local names people yeah. customers are always happy to you know, pass on their information it's a new thing people like talking about their installations what they experience so if a company is willing to give you a few names it's a good sign that you know, they have a base of people who've who are happy so that that's, yeah. that, that's what i was going to say yeah, most, most reputable companies will allow you to uh, have a few names to check on and do so check check them uh, uh, if, if they're at all uh, cautious about letting you know who, who they've installed, uh, be a little wary. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, th well thank you very much uh, for all of you for coming along to uh, uh, share your knowledge. Uh, it certainly sounds like uh, there's at least... Uh, Vesca, you're, you're, are you actually in the market supplying as well? We, uh, we hope to have well. one more um, system by public subscription uh, before the uh, thing closes down, we will then see whether we can do it. Uh, the government have talked about there being a uh, community tariff. Uh, they haven't given details or when. Uh, we will wait and see whether it is. As it is, the um, um, regulations that are trying to cut down on the rent of roof actually apply for having just two systems. So, it, it, yes, it's, it's multiple means more than one. So that we would be hit, instead of uh, getting something like 15%, uh, 15 pence for a uh, 20 kilowatt system, we'll get only 12 pence per kilowatt hour, right. which makes our economics right. rather difficult. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. It certainly seems like you've got uh, at least uh, two, two choices uh, within Forest Row that will give you a a good deal and a, a reputable uh, um, opportunity. Uh, just to close, before I invite you to uh, thank our speakers, uh, to say that you would, if, for those of you who are here for the first session today, when Charles Henry spoke, we would have heard about Peter Brown's uh, concern about the impact of that announcement on their proposal at Tablehurst. Uh, we are actually proposing to have a sort of meeting to see uh, uh, what opportunity there might be to reach out to the community to see if there is a way of actually uh, reducing the impact of that proposed cut on the on the business case that they put together. So uh, watch that, watch this space as well on that, and hopefully uh, that, that was the original. There. That was his original that where it started out from. In yeah. Fact, so maybe we'll end, what we will end up going back. Yeah. And I'm interested yeah. to hear about community tariff mm. possibility. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll just invite you all to uh, thank our our speakers in yeah. the. Uh, Usual way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organisers for uh, what I hope you've all found has been a very uh, useful, educational, uh, and uh, interesting event. Thank you.